Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. Mahershala Ali. Welcome, brother. Hey, thanks for having me. Peace, Peace. King. How Thank you feeling you. today, man? I'm good. I'm good. First time. Yeah. All yeah. right. Yeah. Life's good today? Life is good, man. How y'all doing? Blessed, black, and highly favored, brother. Yeah. So let's get into it because there's so many things to talk about with you right now. Of course, we're here to talk about Swan Song first mm-hmm. and foremost. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, did you produce this movie also? I'm one of the producers on it, yeah. Okay, yeah. so what drew you to this movie in particular? Uh, the dilemma. I think the the story is is really unique. It felt fresh, you know, it wasn't something that I'd seen before. And, uh, you know, you're always looking for that 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 new opportunity to be ch- to be challenged. And something that's just really like resonating with you. And so when I just like looked at all the factors, the director, the story, the character, the opportunity, playing two characters, I was all in. Did I read correctly that this is your first leading role? First. I, I, that's that's nuts to me. I mean, I don't know why I never thought that. I just always thought you was the lead in these movies. Yeah, yeah. No, it's the first. It's been wow. uh, 20 years, 21 years. Yeah. And you did win Oscars already. I want to talk about best that because actor. how yeah. does that change? Some people will say, oh, these awards don't matter and say things like that. But ha- winning an Oscar, right, how did that change your trajectory? Or did it? Did it not matter to you? Did it change things? Oh, it definitely mattered and it changed things. It begins to, you suddenly get more opportunity. Quantity doesn't always equal quality, though, mm-hmm. you know, so... Like maybe your presence is something and in something is suddenly bigger, but you still have to you still have to sift through it all to make sure that you are are locking in on the opportunity that feels right for you. Mm-hmm. You know, it's almost like like a fighter picking fights. Like you could have the potential to beat someone five years from now, but in the moment you wanna make sure that you're you're building properly to get to that place that you wanna be. And so you just gotta Keep a lot of factors in mind as you're choosing roles. Make sure you're you're making things that don't impact your trajectory in a negative way. Let's so, talk about that process though of, of getting to the leading man status because everything yeah. about you says leading man, right? Oh, thank so you. So how do you humble yourself to, I guess, play your position till you get to this point? I, again, another like sort of sports analogy is, you know, you might be seventh, eighth man on the bench, but you believe that you have the capacity to start. Mm-hmm. You know, and so. I think what you try to do is every time you're playing, you just try to show up and do your job and and try to prove that you are are worthy of more minutes, mm-hmm. you know. And you know the arts are a funny thing. There's a there's a lot of factors that are involved. For lack of a better word, it could be really political at times or whatnot. And so you just got to kind of keep doing what you're doing, keep your head down, do the best work you can do, try to keep growing, and try not to repeat, you know. Um, even if you're doing like bit parts and whatnot, you want to try to diversify, you mm-hmm. know? So mm-hmm. you might take something smaller just because it's so different from the last thing you did because then the goal becomes about showing your range as an actor so that eventually when that right thing pops, it people are just constantly seeing you in a different light. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of been my approach to try to be patient um, and also just understand that as long as I'm doing my best work that, you know, things unfold in God's time. Now Absolutely. you said you, yeah. it's like a box of picking a fight. Yeah. Did you ever make the wrong pick like, damn, I should have did this movie or that movie was great. I could have had opportunity, but I didn't go that route. Did you ever make that mistake? Um, well, it's not a mistake, I, but did I, you ever make that decision? You know what? I, I, I'm i sure I have things that could be like, you know, I don't want to say that they're mistakes because I've grown, I've grown from every opportunity. And I think that you're called every role that you get there's something in it there's a reason why you got that role that's that's my approach to it because i've learned it might be hard saying what i've learned from each one but i know i've learned something from each role that i got it for a reason and it impacted me for a reason um and so as long as you're learning it's less about making the the right choice or the wrong choice but it's more about can you kind of like look at your growth as a result of having just done this experience mm-hmm. and where you pushed where you challenged yeah there's some things that come along with it that you may not have enjoyed that you're really disappointed about 
how it's cut together or the director promised you, oh, we're gonna, you're not gonna have to play two dimension or one dimensional villain. We're gonna expand the part. And then you go to shoot it and they truncate your part down and add more fight scenes. You're like, yo, I'm barely in that joint. That mm-hmm. didn't make sense for me to do. I've had that experience. But you gotta kind of eat that mm-hmm. and understand how limited your power is in a scenario. And so for me, I put a lot of pressure on myself in each moment to do the best work I can so that whatever gets on the cutting room floor, like whatever is left, the essence of my effort is still gonna be there to, to help impact the story. What did you learn from Green Book? I learned a lot from the role. First of all, I think like stepping into it, especially coming off of Moonlight, I was looking to do something that felt, that felt really unique, that felt mm-hmm. different. So with every character, and especially stepping into, I was casting that almost five years ago now. So stepping into it, you're just looking at, is this character a character that I've seen before? Is this a character that's a character in the canon of film? And so when I look at somebody who was empowered enough in 1961, 1962, to hire a white man to drive him through the South, when everybody was essentially hiring black people, right? That I interpret that as almost somebody like flipping off the South, so to speak. Like he had his own little ways of of like bucking the system. So when I looked at like his education, his experiences, somebody training in Russia as a kid and playing piano, traveling the world and whatnot, I was like, this is somebody that I hadn't quite seen before. So that right there, I wanted to challenge myself. And especially coming off of Moonlight, I felt like that was a totally different character. And so as far as like the choices that I make in terms of trying to diversify my my roster, so to speak, I was like, this is a good choice. Um, Did you regret it, the role? No, okay. no, no, because I don't regret the work I did. Mm-hmm. And I don't regret regret what attracted me to it and why I did it. Now, in every situation, things get complicated at times. Mm-hmm. And so if anything, I think walking out of it, you learn more about like what is due diligence going into a project. Like you could do your due diligence, you ask some questions, well, this is what I need, this is, you know, that I don't need. But then later on, you kind of learn as things are revealed, you're like, oh man, there's an extra set of questions that I could have asked, but you just also don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And so that's just part of the experiences of growing and moving from being someone who is most often supporting something to almost a lead in something. And that leap is a real leap, you know, especially if at that point I'd been working professionally. I've been a principal on TV since 2000. 2001 Mm -hmm. you know what I mean so um and then suddenly you leap to like your name is second on the call sheet like that's a big shift so the awareness in that you dropping a bunch of singles for years and then suddenly you dropping an album that's a different thing you Mm -hmm. know what I mean and so the awareness and all the details of that and how much of your life changes and the expectations and the responsibilities and all that is you learning too you know you're learning on the fly and especially once you're working with like these big corporations and you're like well I don't agree with this trailer this shouldn't be in it it's mm-hmm. out of context and mm-hmm. they go it tested well you're like mm-hmm. what do you, what can you say to that and so that's often the experience artists find themselves in and uh and you navigate it you learn from it and you try to move on and especially what happens is when you have studios and production companies they're faceless, mm-hmm. right? And so once that film comes out and it may do well in one part of the demographic and another part of, of the country is not feeling it, what, especially as actors of color, you, you walk out kind of carrying that bag mm-hmm. as if you made all those choices or decisions when the faceless companies kind of like, like they, they on the next rollout mm-hmm. for, their next, for their next gig, so. I learned a lot from it. Does that it, make you feel like you want to have more control as far as... That's what made me want to produce. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not what made me want to produce, but it's something that added to the fuel behind behind wanting to produce because so often you're behind the scenes and I'm sure you could talk to 
a healthy group of of actors of color because it's not just black actors but where you find yourself where there isn't a black voice in the producerial role mm -hmm. so what happens is actors have to start saying like oh there's a problem with this scene can we try it this way because ah, that could be problematic and so that inherently becomes part of your job as an actor though you will not be credited as a producer but you're producing because you begin to start trying to protect the film and think about all these things that can like impact the film and impact you as an artist. So in getting the producer credit, often you're already doing that work anyway. Mm -hmm. So I've appreciated being able to move into that space because now there's a legit seat at the table. It's not like you're standing behind the people sitting at the table and being like, hey, can you fix this part? Because that could be problematic or this is actually what we need to go for here. Can you do that? And they may or may not listen to you. That if you're producing, you have, and you're the face of it, it's a way to protect yourself and the story. You know what I mean? First and foremost, the story, but then as a residual effect of protecting the story, you end up protecting yourself. Now, as a, as a producer and an actor, the fact that movies come out now in theaters and online, yeah. do you like that? Because I know some people that say, no, I like theaters. I like yeah. big box theaters. And some people are like, no, nah, I like both. Yeah. And how does your that affect actors? Because we saw how Will Smith for King yeah. Richard actually paid some of the cast members because yeah. it wasn't coming out in theaters. Yeah. Well, you know what I what I appreciate about theaters is that it's the, it's the I want to say the last safe space, but it's the safest space to protect. It's the spacious face, space, safest space for the film for the filmmaker because it's still inappropriate to be in the movie texting and, and like hopping on the yeah, phone real right, quick. Right, you right. can't pause it. You gotta it. be focused. You yeah. can't be on, I mean you can, but like right. somebody might be like, yo, can you shut your phone off, right? Like the sound. The sound, the, it, you get to be immersed in it, right? I, I don't and, like watching movies at home. I you know? I would, but I don't. So that's what I appreciate about it. But what I am learning is, is that we have to embrace the time that we're in and how people want to relate to content and how empowered people feel at this point in, in having things at their fingertips. Mm -hmm. And there's also, in, in this film, to me, Swan Song is a good example of a film that works in both, and I sincerely mean this, because the film, some people are having like these cathartic experiences from seeing this film, right? Because is sort of and break down what the film is about we never did some people so, don't even know what it's about yeah and i it so the film is the film is about uh, a man who is dealing with a terminal illness mm -hmm. and he is presented with the opportunity to clone himself and so this is the not too distant future so it's a, say it's like 2040 so he has a terminal illness and he's presented with this opportunity to clone himself unbeknownst to his family Part of it is that he just can't tell his family. And the reason he can't tell his family is because the this process is new. Mm -hmm. So there's almost still in this semi-testing Test phase, phase mm -hmm. of it. It's not like openly permitted yet. And so with that said, considering that you have somebody who is relatively young, who has a young, ch meaning the character I'm playing, and my, my, the child who was like 10 years old, you have somebody who's looking like, feeling like they're dying before their time, mm -hmm. right? And some of the themes, the way in which we approach it, the way we get into it, I, I believe the way we build the story, I think for some people that are watching it, it's pushing certain buttons, especially considering the time that we're in and so many of us losing people before their time or being a degree of separation from people who are dying, I don't just mean the iconic ones, but just like real friends and family mm -hmm. that have passed away in the last two years, right? So people are having these experiences where I think it's kind of works when they're in the privacy of their own home, mm -hmm. watching this movie mm -hmm. and not necessarily snotting in your mask in a theater, right? But there's also the thing of appreciating a theatrical experience too. And so I found that the music, the movie is working for people who are like at a festival seeing it in, a, in an audience, but it also works, it works really well, like having a singular or like a private experience with you and your loved one or whatever and just gotcha. watching them. You think the majority of people would go in the future and clone themselves to save 
from causing the pain their family would feel knowing that they're about to to die in the future? Um, percentage wise, what percentage would you guess <laughs> people would do that? Um, it, it's hard to say. Um, but listen, would you? Uh, I would. I think in this moment and just looking at my life, you know, and just the things that I I hold dear, I think I would lean towards the natural order of things, you know. Um, um, but I, I do think part of the movie, at least for me, what I take for it is that when you look at my character, once folks see the film, and I want to be careful of giving anything away, mm-hmm. but in part, the advantage that the clone has is that he has all the awareness that the original has like he has all the same memories all the same he's him it's not pet cemetery no <laughs> he's him he's him but he just doesn't have the illness right mm-hmm. and so he, there's this thing where you feel like this guy is like the clone is really about to take advantage of having this new opportunity at life and so i feel like we all have and that character's name is Jack, the clone. I think we all have a Jack in us. We all have a higher potential. We all have our best self. So the work becomes about what do we have to do to manifest our best selves? Like, how do we take stock and take inventory? Do we need a death sentence? Do you need a ticking clock that you're totally aware of to begin to, like, look at some of the changes you need to make in, a li- in your own life? Examine taking stock and inventory of your own issues and toxicity and relationships that you may need to get out of or a job you might need to move beyond or tough choices you have to make in order to be fulfilled, you know? Is it is fulfillment a want or a need? And I think if you can ask yourself, like, actually fulfillment is a need, then it's like, all right, well, it's time to get working, you know? Like, mm-hmm. I can't assume I'm going to be here tomorrow. Again, we've lost too many people yeah, we were always losing people, but especially in this last couple of years, it's felt very heightened. And and so I think, you know, for me, the message in this film is is like get to working towards towards your own fulfillment. You ever get so stuck in character, though, because it's like you do different characters yeah. from all aspects and players and all different people. Do you ever get stuck in a thing and can't get out? Um. And how do you get out if it you is? You know what, I would say, I don't think I ever get stuck in character, but what I do think is I, I think you, I think there's things to take with you from each character. I think there's lessons to take with you, just like there's lessons to take from each relationship or each job or each, you know, you hang out with your uncle long enough, you might pick up some of those really positive things, you know? And so I try to take, I try to take, the things that impact me in a positive way from these from these characters, but each character comes with a certain degree of toxicity too, right? Because mm-hmm. you're living in somebody else's problems for 12, 12 to eighteen hours a day, and so for me, there's a there's a there's a time in which I kind of need post shooting to sort of like almost mourn the character, like to kind of get it out of me because you get it in a rhythm and you get. You, I can't even eat sitting down. It's hard for me to eat sitting down because I'm just so used to rushing all the time. And then you quick change and then you back on set real quick. And at a certain point, you're like, yo, this is not normal. Let me bring it down. I got to let go of the stresses of this character that I've been living with for four months and begin to embrace my own again and and kind of let that go. So it just, it takes time to to shake it, like I just feel it. Like I remember shooting Roxanne, Roxanne, Ooh, Roxanne. You don't want you to get stuck in that character. No, uh, but it, I had nightmares like the last week of shooting in that with that character, like for real. I'd never had it like that before. Mm-hmm. And so there's a thing where your body doesn't necessarily know the difference from the messages you're telling it. And that's mm-hmm. why you have to be so conscious of what, what you're listening to, what you're taking in. I remember listening to the radio, it's like 12. I would turn the radio on at night. And one time my mom came in and she was like, no, turn that off. You can't listen to it. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, uh, uh, you know, she was like, no, there's messages that you need to be conscious of what you're listening to. I ain't trying to screw you guys up for people listening. Yeah, and sleeping. Right. But, um, but like there's messages you need to be conscious of. And mm-hmm. it's like if it's playing and you hear it and you know it, that's one thing. But, you know, so it's like that. You got to you got to. Um, yeah, it takes time to shake some oh, of that stuff. I want to go back to something you said mm-hmm. in regards to swan songs is does that movie change your perception of death and and life? Hmm. You know what? I think it encourages me to 
to live a little fuller. I think it encourages me to to put my foot on the gas a bit. Um, um, I think it really encourages me to try to be as present as possible with my friends and loved ones right now. My grandfather told me years ago, he said, tell people how you feel right now. Mm-hmm. Like, and he, you know, he started, he got te- teared up a little bit and he was like, I didn't know where this was coming from. And he was like, I just want you to know I love you, and, you know? And that always stuck with me. I was about 15 years old. And that always stuck with me. And like, and, and leading up to this, it just makes me think like, Yo, if there's something I want to do, there's something that I want to try, if there's a change I want to make, there's, there's one thing in like thinking about it and kind of road mapping it out through your head, but there's another thing in like a very New York thing, just go, just take action, like move on it. And, and I think that for me is the message, you know, because I just want to make sure that I stay in motion, you know, and I think if we, if we keep like marching forward, that's all we got. We got to keep. We got to keep pushing. We got to keep marching forward because you know, our, all of our numbers are gonna be called. Yeah, so many of us are, are yeah, stuck in, in like a really safe space too. Say that like, again. I'm so sorry. A lot of us get stuck in a safe space where we're comfortable yeah. with the routine of what we're doing in our yeah. lives. We know we have this steady paycheck, and yeah. you're like scared to go out and and yeah. take a risk doing something else. So, did you ever have that experience in your career? Um. I, I've had that experience most of the time, and that's a muscle, the reaction to that. When I start feeling comfortable, I found myself reacting in ways where it, it, it that, that voice gets louder, and you could kind of work to ignore it, but eventually you need to react. So when I was on House of Cards, which was a huge show, it was after the beginning of, I don't know, I was season three, and I started asking to get off the show. And I had friends and family going, are you crazy? This thing is huge. Like, why you want to get off the show? And I was concerned with getting comfortable and finding myself as how I interpret it, just another dude on a show. Correct. And so it was important for me to move on, to keep building towards what I saw for myself, which was swan song. You know what I mean? In a, in a way of like, I want to move up. And I just don't want to be on somebody's show always supporting other people's narratives. So Cheo came to me um, uh, doing Luke Cage and was and he was like, yo, you want to do this show? And I was like, I just got off a of house of cards. He was like, he's going to die. I was like, cool. I, 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 I hated that they killed Cotton Mouth. Man. I was the only reason I did it, though, because they were going to really? kill him. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. Wow. Because I just got off down. of a show. Well, I... I didn't want to get stuck. I didn't want to be on another show you know, for your time was limited. I'd already done like I came into it in um Crossing Jordan in 2001. I did my first year there. I got fired after 1 year or whatever, but everyone else was on there for 7 years and I watched it happen. It was the best thing that could have happened to me, honestly. Like was to get pushed off that show. Mm-hmm. I ended up on like the 4400 and asked for a 3-year deal. So that was going to be short and everyone else was in six year deal. So I always was trying to make sure that I couldn't get too comfortable Mm -hmm. because I didn't want to be, especially as an actor, you don't want to get stuck as one thing. Like, cause that is death for an actor to only blade, but I, I hear you. And that's, that was a real concern. And for me, it's always been about trying to diversify and make sure that I wasn't repeating or playing the same character and making sure that I'm always pushing myself. Otherwise, for me, if I don't feel uncomfortable, if I don't feel uncomfortable, then I know I'm not growing. Mm. And, and so if something feels like it's starting to get easy, it, it, as much as like, I love when things get easy, but at the same time, you're like, it's a plateau. It's, it's like is, a plateau. Yep. And then, it, yeah, and then I get unhappy in a real way. Mm-hmm. And so I already know that about myself. So I kind of have to keep pushing myself and figuring out, all right, how am I going to take on something that scares me a bit? So you Blade's going to die is what you're telling <laughs> me. <laughs> no, no. There's, there's, plenty, there's plenty to work out. There's so much about that that is, that is challenging <laughs> just in general that, you know, I got my hands full. And even in doing it, and then ha- wanting to do other stuff. I don't want to just be Blade. Like, that is one character. And honestly, as huge as that is, as 
huge as the Marvel Cinematic Universe is and all of that is amazing, all these characters are important to me, like equally. Like there's no, it's like, you know, you had five children, like you trying to take care of all them kids, right? You mm-hmm. know? And it's not about like, well, this one's got the most potential. Like <laughs> no, right. you looking out for all of them and you love them, they're yours, you know? And so I wanna, and I love this work, you know? So so I treat them all, I, I try to treat them all equally. I saw you say uh, that you were losing sleep over your voiceover role in The Eternals. And I'm like, why? Your voice is amazing. No, well, I'm talking character though. Okay. And what stresses me is, what always stresses me is character. And so, and all I meant by that was, if you're doing vocal work for something you're months away from filming, you're still putting together all those things in your head. Mm-hmm. You're like, body starting to change, which is gonna change your voice. You don't know if you're gonna go with something a little deeper. You don't know if you're gonna, so suddenly when someone's like, <clears throat> okay, we need you to voice something, you're like, oh, I was coming to that in its natural order. And so it's just something that felt, that is a, that felt a little, premature because otherwise you would never do that right mm-hmm. you know and I don't but Marvel has their their ways of approaching things and and building anticipation which which I love and respect so it's again it's just a new challenge you're like oh snap so these are some choices I got to make now new territory all right I'm not comfortable with it get comfortable with it meaning telling myself mm-hmm. you know and so I embrace that it's just part of it you know uh, and there will be a list of other things that will probably be challenging and uncomfortable you ever thought about doing radio? You got, um, that, you got that quiet storm voice. Late, late night <laughs> quiet storm. Hello, hello, just no, 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 but um. Would you like to hear that? But it, no, 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 no radio. But I respect <laughs> it. I respect it. I respect it. You were you were you an artist at one point? Uh, I'm still an artist. No, I right. make beats. I make beats now. Make beats? I was okay. used to. I was doing stuff with Hyro back in the day, or I was on uh Hieroglyphics Imperium, the label, and doing some stuff before that. So I've always been involved in 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 music in some way, shape or uh, some way, shape or form in my own way. And, you know, I always keep that alive is I'm connected. It, you know, if you grow up in the era, how do you, right. you can't separate yourself. So you love that. doing Roxanne, Roxanne because of that. I, you know, it's you know fun. story coming from Cali? Are you kidding me? Yeah, I had the UTFO records. Those are my early <laughs> records. Like UTFO, Houdini, Fat Boys, like all those were out. Don't respect you like that just yeah. now. Like, no. Sure. Like, heck yeah. yeah. Like, no. I was, like, no. Cali, so I was of disrespectful. People, I, might not have known that. Yeah. I seen, they, 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 you, I seen you get excited when you shout to Uncle Ralph, Uncle Ralph. Oh, was just, yeah. yo. <laughs> yeah, like, no, that's my, and my dad was a New Yorker, so I was out, I'm from California, I'm from the Bay Area, but I was, my dad had moved to New York when I was, when I was three, and so I was coming out here and growing up and getting a taste of New York for the summer. And then I would go back to the Bay and I was like, I, I couldn't explain it, you know? And, and especially like when like B-boying started popping off and you know, I'm going from my dad's spot in Washington Heights down to Harlem and kind of hanging out. You just, for a California kid, it, it's just a lot to take in and you don't even know how to articulate it. but. But how you do that is you're just impacted by the music and the mm-hmm. sound and then your taste broadens, you know? And so I've always had a, like a a broad, strong appetite for, for just the music and the culture. So what about Roxanne, Roxanne? How was yeah. that for you doing that and having that musical background? Roxanne was was both a dream and a nightmare. And, and what I mean is that the playing this character Cross who is, you know, you know, no bueno. Violent, and, mm-hmm. you know, hitting her like we we all know the story. Right. Um, it it was it was honored to be in service of her truth, mm-hmm. you know, and to be able to, in some way, lend to, to be in the foil. Right. I gotta be the I gotta be the bad guy, but she's gonna win in the end right. in some way. Right. So, you gotta give over to that, and that's the only thing that really gave me peace about it. So to do something to help tell an icon story and you know it, and her in particular was was a great thing to be able to do especially having a r- real relationship to the music and mm-hmm. you know being aware at that time as a kid growing up but what was hard was like the actual like the role you had physical to, act yeah. of it and you know you got to go there as an act you got to you got to go there you gotta push yourself and then you gotta do it like take after take after take. So you like pretending to beat somebody up mm-hmm. and strangling them and acting like crazy for 
six hours of the day, like that don't just go away like that. Like you gotta, you gotta shake that off, you know? And so it definitely, I definitely felt it, you know, it has its residual impact. Does that, uh, do you question yourself as an actor nowadays when you're doing that? Cause I was talking to Megan Good recently and she was yeah. saying how, you know, when she does sex acts, she thinks people look at it and think that's how she really gets down. And right. In this era of cancel culture, you think yeah. people be like, oh, he, he must really do that to women. Look how he, he does it so well. You know, I try not to think about it that way. I'm always a little surprised when people can't separate. I feel like Danny Glover had stayed impacted by his part in Color Purple. <laughs> I, I, I'm serious. Like, I felt yeah. like that, that there's not a sweeter man on the planet. Yeah. Like, Danny Glover is so conscious and is always doing something. He's from the Bay and, like, the stuff that he's done for folks, like, consistently. But I feel like sometimes people play roles so well that it's hard for folks to get right. that thing out of their head and they do associate you with that character. So it's something to be to be really mindful of. But, you know, you do the best you can do. Like, I, I know I go through my list of things and that list is growing and it's changing or whatever, but I go through my list of things before I, like, take on playing a character and I know I'm going to commit to it. I'm not, I don't think I'm necessarily going to say no to something because of being worried about how people are going to perceive, perceive it per se, you know, but you know, you make the best choices you can. And also there's something to looking at, um, like a career is a mosaic, right? Like there's all these tiles in it. Each role you play and when you step away, you step back from it, there's a picture, right? You look at Denzel, Denzel's career and, there's all these characters in there. There's characters that are icons and heroes. There's characters that are normal people. He's got a villain up in there, you know? And you step away, you go, oh, you see the spine of his work. You see the picture of his work, and you get a sense of his essence as a person. But you're not going to, hopefully, you don't judge him by one character he played, like, really well, you know? Earlier, you talked about your mother discussing music and the music you listen to and how that mm. can affect you. So mm. how did she feel when you were saying you were doing music when you were younger? <laughs> um, yeah. There's things you share. There's things you don't share. My mom never had an issue with music, per se. She just she just wanted me to be conscious of what, of what I was doing. Mm. Um, and I think when I when I really started doing music in a more committed way. I was I was out the house at that point. I was in college, you know, and and um and honestly, I was about to go to I went to grad school here in in New York. And right before I got into to to school here, um something that felt real kind of happened. I had this like indie opportunity and we printed up records and all this other kind of stuff, but I got into school here and that was a big deal for me and so I dropped the music to come to school and mm -hmm. study acting. And so, um, but my family in general has always been supportive of, of things that I wanted to do. Um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't really jerking around. I would get really passionate about anything I was into. And mm -hmm. so I was able to be supported. When did you start to realize the power of intention? Hmm. That's a good question, man. That's a good question. I, you know what? I would probably say a little over 20 years ago, um, uh, when I converted to Islam, like one of the things that you do is you state your intention before you pray. So I intend to make my Fajr prayer, like my morning prayer or whatever. And then it, it kind of led to me thinking more about like the importance of, of like writing things down. Like I know, I remember one time I wrote down, I don't know, maybe like 2006 or seven or something like that. I wrote down these goals that I wanted to do. I want to book a pilot. I want to do this, that, and other. I wrote them down. I let, kept it in my wallet. I remember I pulled it out sometime later, and I'm like, wow, all these things happened, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, somewhere around then, I began to to understand that, like, and also growing up with my grandmother as well, being around my grandmother a lot, she was always, like, filling my head with certain things. Tell yourself you have $500 million. She's been telling me that since <laughs> I was a little kid. Like, I was like, that's a crazy amount of money, but okay, <laughs> you know? And, and you start telling your things, yourself things, or I remember she would tell me stories about, she would tell me this one story about my, 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 my aunt breaking this lamp. And when she broke this lamp, and my aunt was a kid, but when she broke this lamp, she said, I knew I was gonna do that. 
And my grandmother turned to her and said, see, because you told yourself you was going to do it, right? And so I was, I've was i gotten messages as a, mm-hmm. as a little kid about like being conscious of what you think and what you tell yourself and to to don't be afraid to state your intention because it will help you. It'll kind of be like wind behind your back. Gotcha. Because everything, the reason I ask that because everything, yeah. just hearing you talk, it feels like everything you do is in, intentional. Not everything, but I try. I try to be mm-hmm. intentional. Mm-hmm. I, I do try, you know. How did you feel when Wesley Snipes said you'll you'll do a great job in Blade? Man, I, you know, humbled mm-hmm. and and so encouraged by that because you didn't have to say that. Like you know, wasn't nobody really asking him mm-hmm. like that. And so for 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 him to come out and say that, you know, somebody I look up to so much, I I, I sincerely appreciated that. So thank you, brother. Mm-hmm. Have there been has there been any talks about because you know we got the multiverse in Marvel yeah. now? Has there been yeah. any talks about you know him reprising the role? I can't, I can't talk He's about it. He's trying to get some inside. I can't even talk. I can't even really. You know they going they they put the 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 yeah, hush down. He's been pretty good like, at dodging these questions. Yeah, I can't even. I can't even talk. I really can't really talk about anything. But how much pressure working. is it to do a Marvel movie? I'm learning. It's a lot of pressure, man. It's mm-hmm. a lot. But you know, other people have done it and survived and succeeded. So, you know, I'm just gonna try to set myself up to do the, the absolute best work I could do. What's the next thing for you that you're scared of to mm. accomplish? That you're like, okay, to accomplish. I don't wanna get too comfortable like we've been talking about, not getting too comfortable in the space. Yeah. And so you have to figure out, okay, now I wanna do this that I've mm. never done before. Direct, direct. Yeah, I, I, would, like, I would like to direct a film um, and you know, God willing, that'll happen at some point. Is know? there something on the table now? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, I've had a couple of things pop up, but it it is it's been I, I've said no because of just knowing what is on my acting slate and how I I kind of have to do even if I'm doing multiple things, I have to do one thing at a time. So maybe I got something else on the calendar or on that day, but I can't be doing the thing I'm doing and prepping for the other thing. I'm just I'm not really good at that. I'm I'm pretty solid at doing one thing at a time well, but but uh and directing is like immersive and that's like a it's basically a three year commitment. So once you in development and by the time, you know, you shoot it and it comes out, like that's a it's a big it's a big undertaking, but but I, I hope to be in that space at some point. What would be your dream role you'd like to you'd like to tell? Hmm. A story. Hmm. Oh, you know what? That was Marvin Gaye for me for a long time. I, I can't, I can't say what it would be now. I think you know, um, there's other people out there that are right for that. That are you know, but um, I don't know, man. I, honestly, I would have to say that I, I'm kind of living it in in the way of like just getting to to play this character on Swan Song, even just the the range and like just what it asked of me, mm-hmm. just playing even two characters like and. It was all pretty challenging, but in a positive way, in a way where I felt I felt pushed and I loved the arc of the character. I loved what he was about. And I loved who I got to work with. I got to work with Naomi Harris and Glenn Close and like that was mm-hmm. incredible, you know? Um so How far yeah. away do you think we are from cloning people? <laughs> you think there's some clones out there it already? It could be. Hey, I, <laughs> the real me might be at home right now. <laughs> you, know? Right. you know, we always like, I wish I had a clone to go and do this sure, press run. Sure. He might be in <laughs> London yeah, doing press. Right <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know who 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 knows. But I, it's but doing this shoot. did it make you feel like in 20 years this might for real happen? Uh, of course. I mean, they got of robots course. that can reproduce now. Of They've course. already reprodu- clone sheep who knows yeah yeah I, yeah i'm they they working on it somebody look all them dudes up there flying to space i'm sure That's they right. trying to hang out on a little bit earlier too so you can it's check coming. out swan song december 17th in mm-hmm. theaters or on uh, uh, apple tv plus and we appreciate you for joining us hey brother. thanks for having me good to see y'all now we're gonna play one of your beats that you produced back in the day <laughs> ah! no, I'm just with you. Herschela Ali. Now, what, who the hell is Herschela? Herschela. My Herschela. My Herschela. He's looking at your skin complexion, yeah, bro. Yeah, he said that chocolate Herschel skin. That's, 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 that's what you just said, bro. Where did the name bro. come from? Herschela. My Herschela, my real name, my birth name is Mahershala Hashbaz. It's in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 1 and 3. It's the longest name in the Bible. You just called this man Hershey's, bro. <laughs> you know, it's all good. They called me that grow, growing up. I, I got I, I got caught being, being called Hershey a couple times, man. I was like, no, can't do, we can't do that. We can't do that. 
Mahershala Ali, it's The Breakfast Club. Good morning. Leave him out of y'all games. 